Good afternoon, everyone. I uh, just wanted to go ahead and start this session. Uh, appreciate you joining us for the Animal Care and Control Association of Tennessee Conference. Uh, our 12 o'clock speaker is Inga Fricke. Um, Inga has worked in the field of animal welfare for two, two decades and is the executive director of McKamey Animal Center in Chattanooga. To learn more about her background, please check her out on the bio under the speakers tab. It has much more extensive um, bio on her and I would encourage you to check that out. Today, she'll be talking to us about how to build humane communities. I would like for you to welcome her uh, and her presentation today. Just as a housekeeping matter, we do wanna make sure that you post all the questions in the chat and I'll be monitoring that and we'll ask those to her at the end of her presentation. So Inga, again, we appreciate you being here. Go ahead. Great, hey, can you hear me? All right, great. Hi, everybody. Thank you, Michael, for that introduction. And thank you, everybody, for allowing me to give this presentation. Um, when I was with HSUS, this was actually one of my favorite presentations to deliver when I was going around the country um, because it gives me a chance to kind of lay out an overview of what we're all working towards, which is kind of that utopia for animals and really thinking about how we can make our entire communities the best possible places for animals. So taking that 30,000 foot big picture view, but then also hopefully giving you some roadmap ideas for your own community and how you can actually take that vision and turn it into reality. So if I were going to ask you, what do you think a humane community really looks like? If you had to describe that utopia for animals in your community, what would that be? What would you tell me? Take a, just a couple of seconds. You can put some notes in the chat if you like, or you can just write down your own notes or think about it in your head. But what would that actually look like for you if you were going to be describing your perfect community? Just take a moment. My guess is that as you are thinking about that and describing it, you're going to kind of identify a few common themes, right? And of course, my screen is not working, hold on. Okay, so what I'm imagining you would say is that every single animal in your community has a home to call their own, right? With people who love them, that every human who wants a pet in their life can actually have one that every single animal is getting the preventative and emergency vet care that it needs, that every community pet that lives outside a home is safe and well provided for, that we have safety nets in place for the animals who really need those, that every animal has the benefit of all five freedoms every day, and that all of the animals in our community are valued, whether they're pets, wildlife, farmed animals, whatever. I think probably everything you've thought of fits somewhere in here. You may have added uh, some things that I haven't, but I think this kind of generally describes what we all would long for, right? But we know that in our communities, generally we're not there yet. We still have animal abuse. We still have neglected animals. We still have all kinds of problems and they make us mental, right? I get it. It's a tough business that we are in but maybe we can change our perspective a little bit and think of things a little bit differently. Jim in the last presentation actually mentioned things like, you know, shelter youth intake is down over 60% from what it was when he and I started in this field. Euthanasia is down drastically. This is all happening at a time pet ownership continues to skyrocket. So it's not like there are fewer pets out there in the country. So of course, intake is going down. The number of animals we have is going up and yet all of our other numbers are trending in the right direction. That's something for us to really hold on to and embrace and celebrate and maybe take with us as we're looking ahead to how we can continue making improvements in our own community. So based on this, I'm gonna throw out some crazy concepts for you, right? What if most people in our community are actually good people? They're not all animal abusers or people who intend to do harm to animals. 
what if most of the pets in our community are actually in good hands with the people they're with? What if most people truly do love their pets and are genuinely doing the best they can for them? And what if some of the animals in our community actually don't even need us to interview? They're doing just fine. I know it's crazy, but kind of go with me on this, right? I say that because some of the statistics we're seeing from our community at large, the entire country, show us that we are not the only crazy animal people out there anymore, right? 95% of people in some studies say, yeah, my pets are family. Not just things, not just property, but their family. Nearly three quarters of pets are sleeping with their humans on the bed. Those of us who are crazy have their pets sleep in the bed, but that's probably a different story, right? Tons and tons of our dog and cat parents say, yeah, I've canceled plans just to hang out and chill with my pet, right? Again, it's not just us. And on and on and on. We see that people, in fact, really do share our love of animals. And that's something, again, to hold on to as we're looking at our community at large. This is also reflected in our field as well. Um, it used to be when I started, there was a study that it said, well, people make up their minds to give up their pets six months before they ever show up at the shelter. So don't even bother trying to get them to change their minds. Well, thankfully there are some agencies out there that have challenged that and found that it's actually not true anymore. That most people who are bringing us their animals actually don't want to give up their pets. And actually would keep their pets if we offered them a solution that would help with that. In fact, studies have found that almost all of the people who said, yes, I want to keep my pet if you help me, when you give them the help, they keep their pets. That's pretty amazing. Right? This is one program in South LA. They were able to prevent over 10,000 animals from entering their shelter system in a five-year period just by saying, how can I help you solve this problem and would it help you keep your pet? And the really great news is it's not like this intervention cost them a ton of money. You're talking about $100, $150 max for a lot of these interventions. That's a lot of lives saved for not that much actual cost, which should be really encouraging to all of us. Right? Now, selfishly in our own communities, if we're thinking about this, we do have to look at it from our perspective and ask, you know, why do we want to do this? Why do we want to focus on keeping pets in homes and out of the shelter and really looking at our community holistically? Well, it makes dollars and cents for us too. So imagine we have Dave and Fluffy and Dave has to give Fluffy up because Fluffy needs treatment for, let's say for mange and Dave knows he can't afford it. So he comes to our doors, right? We do our intake processing. We probably have to set an appointment, get him in here, get all the information, take all the time that takes. We have to do an intake exam, make sure that Fluffy's medical condition is being treated. Met, uh, Fluffy has vaccinations, all of that good stuff. We have to find a literal cage for Fluffy, which means somebody else may get booted or somebody has to be moved somewhere else to make that space for Fluffy. We have to make sure Fluffy is behaviorally sound and do all those things that we do. And then we have to find a new owner for Fluffy who hopefully will love Fluffy almost as much as Dave did, right? That is a lot of work that we put into each and every animal. A lot of effort, a lot of time, a lot of resources. How much more time and effort and resources would we have if instead of going through all of this to take Fluffy in, we instead said to Dave, hey, how about we help you fix your problem and you keep Fluffy? And we reserve all of that extra time, effort, and money to helping an animal who doesn't have a person already attached to them, who loves them. We're going to have to treat the mange anyway, right? So why not maybe keep that space open and think about how we can divert those resources? Mm -hmm. When we think about our community, our shelter or our rescue, our organization really should be the center, the heart of animal welfare, right? We should be at the middle, the very, very middle of everything, but we can't do it alone. 
for us to truly create a humane community, we need a lot of partnerships. And Jim was talking about collaboration. It's critical for us to save lives. We need spay neuter infrastructure in our communities, right? We need a lot more vets, a lot more offices, a lot more people on board. We need pantries for people who are struggling day to day to provide food for their pets. We need affordable vet care, um, both preventative and uh, reactive if somebody actually has an issue. We need behavior support for people to help solve their problems because, before they become so monumental that they have to surrender their animal to us. We need community cat initiatives that will help with TNR and making sure that um, only cats that really need rescue are winding up in our shelter and rescue system. We need a strong lost and found infrastructure to reunite people with their pets as quickly and efficiently as possible. We need to embrace adopters rather than turning them away. We need to recognize that adopters are not the same pool as our surrenderers and not treat them that way. We need housing, legitimate housing options for people so that they don't have to surrender their pets when they don't want to just because they have no ability to live with them. And ultimately we need good laws, good regulations, good policies that help us bring all of this together. So again, our shelters and rescues have to be the heart of all this, but we can't do it alone. We need to start looking outwards and putting all of these pieces of the puzzle together so that we can truly build our humane community. So I'm gonna challenge you to think about two key questions. Why are the animals ending up with you? Are you seeing patterns? Are there common denominators, common reasons that people are, are having to separate themselves from their pets in your community? And are there ways maybe to, instead of taking them in, to maybe keep them safely at home where they will be loved and cared for and treated humanely? When we're looking at this idea of surrenders that we can prevent to make sure our community is hum as humane as possible and only those animals that truly need us wind up in our care, there's some low hanging fruit. You know, we talk a lot generally about access to veterinary care and spay neuter, super important, but those are things that I think people have been focused on for quite some time. But there's a whole series of other challenges that are higher hanging fruit that are unfortunately driving animals to our doors. But the good news is these also are things that we can start to do something about if we put our minds to it. And so these are the things that I wanna talk about kind of one by one. So let's start with this idea of behavior challenges that are driving pets regrettably to our doors. Um, we used to kind of just say, well, you know, if you give up your pet because of a house training issue or because of a behavior issue, you know, clearly you, you just don't care. You're just not trying enough. Well, maybe we need to rethink that and say, maybe it's on us to help our community think in a new way about behavior or receive that information, right? Because to us, this is all so obvious, right? If your puppy is having accidents, it's because you're not scheduling it correctly. You're not recognizing 20 minutes after they eat, 20 minutes after they sleep, yada, yada, right? If the cat is peeing outside the litter box, it's probably because they have um, uh, an infection, they need to go to the vet, all of that. Barking and chewing, your pet is bored, there are things you can do. To us, this is just intuitive. Right? And I am absolutely guilty of walk, watching somebody walk out the door of admissions and going, duh, you know, they are so stupid. Why didn't they? Right? Well, let me ask you, how many of you came out of the womb understanding that if a, if a cat is peeing outside the litter box, it's probably because they experienced pain when they went to the bathroom inside the litter box, but they can't necessarily associate that pain with an internal urinary tract problem. So they associate it with something that hurt them within the litter box itself. So they're moving to a, an outside source that's not caught, going to cause them pain. And really the best way to handle that is to take them to a veterinarian to see if they have a URI and get that treated, right? I don't know about you, but I wasn't born just knowing that. Somebody had to teach it to me or I had to read it in a book, 
right? The reality is there are some people for whom this is just like English. It makes total sense. For me, this is complete gobbledygook Greek, right? It's like Charlie Brown's teacher doing the womp womp when I look at it, my eyes glaze over, right? So what's obvious to us about animal care and behavior, we have to recognize it really isn't to members of our community who haven't read the information, who haven't had someone around to teach them. So maybe our role is to translate this into something that they can actually understand rather than just beating them up for not knowing intuitively that when a cat pees outside the litter box, you should probably take it to the vet. Right? Most of the time when we're talking about behavior, a lot of us think about this, which makes sense, right? Behavior classes, good manners classes, all of that is very, very important. And that's something that a lot of us do or already have access to in our communities. But how many of us would come up on a situation like this and think, huh, I wonder if that's a behavior problem that we can solve, right? I think most of us intuitively jump to, well, clearly they don't care at all about this dog. They don't give a rip. That dog needs to be taken away. This is a potential abuse situation. But maybe that dog is out there because um, he's fighting with another dog in the house and this is the only way they've come up to keep them separated and safe. Or maybe Aunt Millie had just broke her hip and she's moved in temporarily and they're worried that because he jumps around so much, he's gonna knock her over. So for her safety and the dog's safety, this is what they've decided to do. Or maybe they have no idea about things like crate training or baby gates or anything like that. This scene very often is related to behavioral issues. And yet if we are not looking at it as a potential behavior challenge, we're gonna miss the opportunity to help fix that situation, not just for this dog, but for any other dogs that that family has. Same thing with cats. Actually, what uh, they have found, um, there's a program, for example, in New York City, where they developed a cat behavior line, and they found that uh, most cat problems that would have otherwise resulted in the cat either being surrendered to a shelter or just be put out on the street, they can be solved with just two phone calls. Imagine that if you could save cats from coming into your shelter or more likely just being put outside just by creating a little helpline that can resolve things in two phone calls. It's amazing, but it's our choice whether or not we do that. Okay. So behavior is just one of those higher hanging fruit reasons why animals end up in our care and not safely at home. Housing is another challenge that people in our community face. Okay. Now, how many of you have said, I would live in my car before I gave up my pets? Right? I said it plenty of times until I was selling my house. I had three weeks till closing. I had nowhere to live. And I had three dogs, two cats, a hedgehog, and a Subaru Impreza hatchback. And that's when it really hit me that, yeah, easy to say, a whole lot harder to do. The reality is most people are genuinely trying to find housing with their pets, but the deck is stacked against them. Okay. The housing industry, believe it or not, loves pet owners. They have found they are a cash cow and they are building rental housing now with washing stations and concierge walk-in services and dog parks and all kinds of stuff, which is great except that every single study still shows that inability to find rental housing is one of the top reasons, if not the top reason, people are separated from their pets. A very recent poll found that 76% of people with pets said, yeah, it's nearly impossible for me to find housing. It's a reality. And why is that? It really comes down to this concept of pet friendly, right? I just randomly Googled um, pet friendly housing and found this on the screen. So apologies to anybody who might be from Abilene or know this place, right? I kind of picked it because I was like, wow, they have birthday parties for their pets. Like this must be an amazing place to live. 
And yet when you check out their pet policy, there's a pet limit, no more than uh, two pets, no more than 30 pounds each. There's a pet deposit of 300 per pet. That's in addition to your first and last month's rent. And no quote unquote aggressive breeds are allowed. Kind of makes you think a little bit about what pet friendly means, right? Try this one, another pet friendly community. Oops. This one also has a limit on the number of pets. It's got, in addition to the pet, the monthly pet rent. And it says, uh, we welcome most breeds of dogs, but because certain dogs do not thrive in a community environment, we cannot accommodate the following breeds or mixes. Akita, American Staffordshire Terrier, Bull Terrier, Chow, Doberman, German Shepherd, Husky, Pitbull, Presley Canary, Rottweiler, Mastiff, Laudatori, Brindisino, Sharpe, Tosa, St. Bernard, Great Dane Dog, Argentino, or Cabano, Alaskan Malamute, Cordova, Fighting Dog, Spanish, Alano, and Real Hybrid, or mixes thereof. I don't know in what universe this sounds like welcoming pets, but for most people, this is not truly pet friendly. Pet friendly very often is anything but, okay? because we know that virtually all rental housing has restrictions. Over half of rental housing has breed restrictions. Over half has size restrictions, which are often default breed restrictions, right? Number limits, if you have three pets, sorry, you're gonna have to give one up. Age limits, too young or too old. And then those fees that they're asking you to rack up. Not very friendly to pets at all. But the bright side for us is there are things that we can do to encourage more truly pet welcome properties in our community, just by sharing information. I mean. Property owners, they're not experts the way we are. They don't know that, for example, there is no such thing as an aggressive breed. They don't know that just because a dog is under 35 pounds, it's automatically good for an apartment and something over 35 pounds is automatically bad. They don't know most anything that we know. But not only can we share that information for them, we can give them incentives. Right? We can share with them that studies show 83% of uh, uh, property owners fill those vacancies faster if they accept pets. That's dollars and cents information for a landlord. And people with pets stay in their units longer. That's a whole lot of money because property owners pay a lot when they have to turn over a unit. And here's big, big, big information that we can share fewer than 10% of uh, renters with pets actually have damage caused by pets. Those that cause the most damage are renters with kids, right? But there's this perception that, well, if you've got pets, you're gonna destroy the place. But actually we have evidence now in a couple of studies that have been done that shows that's not the case. And when that damage does happen, the average cost of repairs nationally is only about $210. Compare that to how much they rake in on those pet deposits and those monthly pet fees. This is great information for us, great ammunition to actually, if we decided to go out and talk to property owners about maybe rethinking some of those policies and taking a chance to actually expand those opportunities for pet owners in our community. And it's also beneficial for us because a third of renters who already have pets say, sure, I'd get another one if I were, if I knew it wasn't gonna be a problem. And a third of renters without pets would take on at least one pet if it wasn't going to be a problem rented, right? That's millions of animals that could potentially be adopted if all we did was get rid of some of these restrictions that are in our rental communities. And before we leave this topic, I just wanted to say a note about um, abandonments. Um, I think rightly so, there's not a whole lot in our field that makes us more mental than uh, people who move and leave their pets behind, right? That's like the ultimate not caring. Well, there was an agency that thankfully started recording some of the messages that they got from people who had left pets behind. And this is what they shared. Um, I try to get back to my old house. It takes three hours by bus. I go every other day. Right? There's no heat or electricity there. We're staying with somebody else, but we'll be back. Can you help me? 
I've been evicted. I have my dog in an abandoned house while I stay at my friend's because it can't stay there. Can you help me? These are not stories of people who were cold and heartless and didn't care and left their pets behind. These are stories of people who were legitimately trying to keep their pets with them. So maybe even on this front, we can rethink a little bit about some of those circumstances. And it all comes to back to making that decision if we want to, to try and address the housing issue in our community to make it more humane. Okay. Finances, finances are another big issue that we face. And of course, what we hear all the time is, well, if you can't afford to have a pet, you shouldn't have one. Well, the reality is pets are not Birkin bags. They're not Bentleys, they're not luxury items. They're part of the family. And people shouldn't necessarily be deprived family members just because of their economic circumstance, especially when for a lot of people, their pets are the only thing they have that's truly of value to them. So many people in our country are facing economic challenges. This was even before the pandemic, 50 million Americans living in poverty. And think about it, the poverty line is only $23,000 a year for a family of four. That's amazing that people even subsist on that. So many families are at the edge, if not over the edge, and yet they still deserve the love of pets. And to make it really clear, I think a lot of times we confuse a lack of access with a lack of caring. Just because somebody doesn't have access to veterinary care, and um, all kinds of supplies that they need doesn't mean they don't care and they don't want it and wouldn't use it if it were offered. I was fortunate enough to spend a lot of time in Puerto Rico helping to run a spayathon for Puerto Rico. And we literally saw hundreds, thousands of people willing to camp out overnight in front of arenas and stadiums just for the chance of trying to get their pet a spay neuter surgery the next day. I probably wouldn't because I have the luxury of making an appointment for that. So when you think about it, who cares more? The HSUS Pets for Life program has done a really great job of kind of putting this in perspective. And their research shows that um, when they go into the most underserved areas of virtually any community, most of those pets have never seen a vet in their life. And most of those people have never even had any contact with the shelter. So these aren't the neighborhoods that um, are causing the most problems for animal control where surrenders are just flowing in. They're pretty much forgotten even by our field. Right? And not surprisingly, most of the pets that they encounter in these communities are not altered. They've never seen a vet. But when people in those communities are given resources and tangible access to things like spay neuter surgery, the vast majority of them want those services. And those neighborhoods then mirror the rest of the country with about 85, 80 to 85% of those animals actually altered. So it's not because they don't want to, it's not because they're too macho, it's not because of any of the other things that you hear or that we speculated, it's literally because they don't have the access. But when they're offered, they take advantage of it for their pets. Okay. One thing I would encourage all of you to do is look at your own community and take a hard look at this access issue. Um, this was actually a long time ago. It is Memphis, but a long time ago, so apologies to Memphis, but it's a really good demonstration of what we've seen over and over and over when we've done this exercise. I have students today that do this exercise and find it is the same all around the country. We ask, just go ahead and plot out in your city or your town, your community at large, where's the stuff? Where are the, the veterinary hospitals and the pet supply stores and who's honoring spay neuter vouchers, all of that. And just plot it out, put it out on a map of your community. And very often when you do that, it looks like a nice distribution of resources, you know, doesn't look too bad until you overlay income data on that. And again, this is old information, but I'm guessing some of this income um, overlay is not, uh, has not changed much over the years. But what we find over and over, regardless of the community from Maine to California, 
when you overlay that economic information, it gives you a very different picture. What look like resources are you know, distributed fairly well, starts to become, wow, there are almost no resources in the areas that are most economically challenged. On this map, it's the dark green. So the darker green you are, the poorer the neighborhood. Those are people that probably don't have access to vehicles, right? And you probably can't take a 45 pound lab mix onto the bus with you. So even though some of those resources aren't too far for them, they might as well be in a whole nother state because they don't have physical access to them. When you actually do this exercise and overlay where the resources are with where the need is based on economic data, I can almost guarantee you're gonna find something similar, that there's a huge disconnect. And that really kind of, I think, gives us a very different perspective about our community and how we need to look at how people are caring for their animals. Because remember, a lack of access to resources does not mean a lack of caring about their pets and wanting to provide those resources for pets. And just a quick example, this is a dog named Rich who um, came into a shelter in South Carolina because his owners recognized they had done everything they could. Um, they had done all the old wives tale kind of remedies and uh, recognized that Rich just was not healing with them. As much as they loved him, they knew it was time, unfortunately, to do something different. So they came to the shelter to give him up. And frankly, you know, my old shelter, most places would look at this and go, wow, this is a huge abuse case. They never should have let it get this far. This poor animal is suffering. We need to deal with this, right? Well, thankfully the shelter said, wait a minute, we have a dog that's in need, owners that have the love, but no access to care we would have to give the care anyway. What if we sent Rich back with his owners, but actually gave his owners the care that Rich needs? Kind of a different concept, especially when they uh, tried this a few years ago. What they found was they didn't need to take Rich in because Rich very quickly responded to treatment in the home with his family and suddenly became the dog that they loved again. And actually this was rich probably about, I think six months later. This would very easily have been not just an intake, but a potential cruelty case. Instead, they've recognized it's in our best interest to keep rich at home with a family who loves him, but just give them those resources. And generally speaking, it doesn't take much. We're talking about spay and neuter. We're talking about deworming, flea meds, over-the-counter medications general information for people who, again, they weren't born knowing it, just like we weren't. We have information to share and resources to share. It's just deciding, hey, this is something we want to do in our community to help make it more humane. And then community cats. Old thinking was, well, we take them in, right? There's a stray cat out there, we take it in. And unfortunately, um, as much as 70% of shelter euthanasia really was community and feral cats. Now we know better. We have amazing shelter medicine experts who have studied this and realized that community cats are generally doing just fine where they are. Where they tend to suffer is with us because they get stressed, they get sick. Unfortunately, they have to be euthanized very often. So why are we doing it, right? What they found over and over when they look at community after community was there's a tiny, tiny fraction of cats that wind up in our care or even having contact with us. The overwhelming majority are living their cat lives out in the community and never ever touch a shelter floor or an animal control vehicle. And they're doing fine. But if you're one of the unfortunate ones who does come in contact with us, you're almost guaranteed to be stressed, to get sick, to have that potential for euthanasia. And this kind of data is why the shelter experts really started saying, what are we doing? We're not having a beneficial impact on the community in terms of um, changing population numbers or anything like that by taking these cats in. All we're doing is making life miserable for a very unlucky cat. So we should stop, right? And when they talk to the public, most of the public agrees, yeah, if it's a choice between having the cat euthanized or leaving it where it is, we're okay with you leaving it where it is. 
Now, obviously changing to a position that says, hey, we're not gonna take in community or feral cats, that does really good things for our shelter numbers, obviously, right? But much, much more important than this is that there's little to no typical community backlash from the community as a whole. In fact, when they've done studies, they found that where these policies of just don't take the community or feral cats in, ideally, if you're gonna use resources for them, alter them and put them back out, the community is actually very supportive of this. And you don't have that mass, oh my gosh, everybody's gonna be calling and complaining. It just doesn't happen that way. And this has now become mainstream enough that back, I believe in March, March or May, I can't remember, NACA actually came out with a position statement, I believe it was authored by Dr. Kate Hurley that says, that taking in healthy free roaming cats for any purpose other than altering them and putting back them back out fails to serve commonly held goals of community animal management protection programs and as such is a misuse of time and public funds and should be avoided. That means now all of the national animal welfare organizations are united in saying that the best thing we can do for our community cats and free roaming cats is leave them where they are. Ideally, alter them, but leave them where they are. Mm -hmm. Switching gears just a little bit, in terms of helping our communities, not only should we be looking at the reasons people surrender externally, like um, behavior challenges or um, access to resources, but maybe sometimes we need to look at ourselves right, and what we're doing. Returns to owner, for example, is our internal policy designed to make somebody come down and take the day off work and um, fill out a bunch of paperwork and pay a bunch of money. And well, if you can't pay the fine, you can't get your animal back. Or is it more focused on actually return, doing that one free ride home for an animal that's licensed or uh, microchipped, for example, or um, helping people you know, by waiving fees making it as easy as possible for animals to get back to the people that love them instead of staying with us. In terms of animal control, are we using the old sight and seeds mentality where we're going out looking for problems or are we looking for solutions to help people resolve their problems? So um, I know, you know, even in Nashville, for example, um, shout out to them because I believe their officers actually have toolkits on their trucks to fix fences for example, rather than just citing somebody whose animal keeps getting out of the fence. It's amazing proactive thinking that's designed to really help and it's outside the box. In our adoptions, are we judging and scrutinizing our adopters and saying, hey, we need to make sure that you are good enough for this animal? Or are we welcoming people and saying, thank you for wanting to adopt. Here's an adopter's welcome approach that's going to help make sure that you can be part of the solution. And there are a lot of tools and resources out there right now that will let us kind of assess our own internal policies and ask, are we helping or are we inadvertently hurting ourselves with the policies that we have? And then we also need to look at where we can intervene in our community. Again, for our animal control officers, are they looking to find problems or are they looking to support solutions? Are we connecting people, bringing resources to them out in the community? Are we providing resources like helplines and um, other avenues of support for pet owners to address problems before they become so monumental that the person needs to surrender their animal? And are we giving people options right at the front counter or when they call on the phone to ask them, hey, if I can help you, would you be able to keep your pet? and then finding those resources for those who say yes. Really a lot of this is about looking at our own toolbox. So what can we offer? Again, recognizing we are the experts in our community and in our field. Are we sharing our expertise enough? And then are we bringing other people into the fold to help us bring that expertise to life? Obviously we usually think of vets, right? And we'll also think of trainers but are there, for example, fencing companies that are willing to work with us? Are there people who are willing to build shelters for us? Are there willing uh, people who are maybe willing to 
um, put up uh, tether lines or um, do other things to help people in the community to make sure that they're doing, uh, they're actually achieving humane pet caretaking. Um, even things like attorneys and others, you know, attorneys can be instrumental. For example, um, if somebody is being evicted or if somebody um, needs to uh, try and find a place by demonstrating that their animal is an emotion support animal. So think outside the box. Again, if you've identified a challenge to humane uh, caretaking in your community, think about all of the other people that can join us in the effort to address that. Do your community assessment. Take that hard look at your community and where the resources are and really get that perspective of, is it just that people don't care or is it that they truly don't have access? And if it's an access issue, how can we help bring those resources to people rather than condemning them for not taking advantage of those resources? And then do this exercise in your own organization. Really sit down and say, what can we do, right? What is our low hanging fruit in our community or our higher hanging fruit that we can start looking at? Maybe on the proactive side, it's doing some free vaccine clinics. And then if something does become ill, having an emergency fund. Or maybe for lost pets, the proactive side is having some microchip clinics in areas that need them. And then if an animal does become lost, having that free ride home program. So do this exercise with your teams and really think about where you can identify opportunities to make your community more humane. And the bottom line is just do something. Start somewhere. You don't have to solve all of your community problems. You don't have to save the world. You don't have to tackle everything at once. But if there's something that struck you during the course of this presentation or something you've been thinking about, just start, just do it. And if it doesn't work, that's okay, pivot. Try something else. This is about making the effort, starting with baby steps and then really hitting on what's going to be as successful as possible for your community. That's what I got. So I'm happy to answer any questions you might have. If anyone has any questions, we would invite you to put those in the chat and I'll be reading those out uh, for answers. We did have one person make a comment that said, um, back when you were talking about uh, making appointments for folks and, and taking their animals to the vet, they said they had seen more people keeping free medical appointments for their pets than they had seen for themselves. Yeah, you know, it is amazing how much people really do love their pets. I always think about, to um, an old page in a really old NACA manual years ago where it had kind of a spectrum. And if you think about it, you know, at the top of the spectrum are the people who clone their pets, like would literally die for their pets, like will spend more money than I'll ever make in my lifetime on their pets. The bottom of the spectrum is uh, the people who genuinely want to harm and abuse their pets. But every place in the middle are people who actually really do love and care for their pets. It may not be exactly the way we care for them or would want to see it done, but just about everybody is on that spectrum trying to do the best that they can because their pets are family. And it gets so easy for us as shelters and rescues to look at all of the animals coming in, the animals that are quote, being dumped, um, the people who don't want their animals, the people that we have to cite for violations, all of that. And it gives us that perspective that everybody's like that, nobody cares, um, it's all just hopeless. So what I would encourage you to do is, um, in addition to some of those exercises about your community, go out and have your staff go out and watch people actually enjoying their pets. Go someplace that people take their pets for walks or want to hang out at a dog park or even, you know, a dog show, an agility club. There are more, many, many, many times more people in our community that love their pets and are um, enjoying their pets than there are who would put their pets at risk or put them in harm's way. So find those opportunities to really kind of look at that good and recognize that, yeah, most people are trying their best. And if we can help them do even better, we can keep our communities going in that positive direction. 
we do have a couple of questions. It says, do you think it is a possible implicit bias that we don't think about how restrictive homeowners associations can be regarding pets? We only seem to mention landlords. That's a good point. And actually, you're right. Um, that's something that we definitely should group. Anytime there's any kind of a restriction, um, it has an impact. If you do have homeowners associations in your community that, for example, um, have restrictions on uh, fencing, for example, or that do have things like pet limits or breed restrictions or anything, absolutely, um, those are opportunities. Uh, to try and make a difference. They don't necessarily have the same incentive as landlords. So I think in some ways it might be a little tougher to have conversations with them because for landlords, we can definitely say, hey, it's money in your pocket if you get rid of these restrictions. But again, I think the principle holds true that those who have created those homeowners association restrictions, they are not aware that there are no aggressive breeds. They're not aware that there's a good house dog and a bad house dog. They're not aware of um, some of the uh, inherent uh, issues that they assume are associated with animals and some of the tricks and techniques that could be used to help make their community a really humane one. They're usually worried about barking. They're usually worried about um, you know, uh, unsightliness, all of that. So even on that front, there are definitely things, even though we can't necessarily use the financial leverage that we do with landlords, there are also ways to address homeowners associations. And that's a great point. Thank you. Okay. Next question is says, uh, do you include language about one health in your communications with the public, with policymakers, et cetera? And if so, what is the reaction? Um, One Health is definitely something that has been discussed a lot now with respect to access to veterinary care and this concept that the entire family, we should be looking at the entire circumstance. Um, I don't know that most people are specifically um, using that language right now, but I think it's definitely something that we should get to. And absolutely, if you are interested in working on the access to veterinary care issue in your community, you definitely should be looking at all of those concepts, thinking about um, what they're doing um, at the uh, University of Tennessee, for example, with the Lyme care, all of that. Access to veterinary care is definitely an up and coming topic and um, something that we can all definitely uh, look at in our communities to try and improve that. A couple of folks asked, uh, could they have access to your PowerPoints? I wanted to let you know that all that's, uh, the recording will definitely be on the uh, WOVA site that you're, we're using as the platform for this year. So that will definitely be there. We will see regarding the PowerPoints. And then the last question that we have, it says, do you have a vet on staff to give the public flea and tick medications? Uh, at our facility, we are fortunate enough that we do have a veterinary staff here um, but you can also, if there are non-prescription medications, there are things that you can do. Um, if you don't have a, a veterinarian on staff, you can also think about trying to build partnerships with local veterinarians. Um, a lot of times it's about informing them also that they are missing out on a segment of the community uh, when they are not uh, um, providing some of these things and encouraging people to come into them. So it's a different avenue of providing those services and maybe getting people in front of them that otherwise wouldn't have gone to the veterinarian. Um, definitely Pets for Life is a great model in terms of getting specific information about how to provide veterinary access directly to people in the community. So I would definitely encourage you to look at a lot of that Pets for Life material for some advice and to get started on that front. All right, that's all of our questions for today. Inga, thank you for uh, helping us uh, see kind of an overall picture on how we can better help our communities. Uh, thank you for the work that you're currently doing in Chattanooga and we appreciate you joining us today. Uh, for all of our attendees, you've got about a 10 minute break and then we invite you back at one o'clock uh, central uh, to join the next session. So y'all have a great day. Thank you again. Thank you, Michael.